So um, I love when people start talking about um, attribution modeling and multi-channel funnel because obviously these are some quite advanced topics and as a consultant I typically see that not many companies are actually leveraging this. So a quick poll, everybody take a right hand up. This, this one. Perfect. So everybody who is not using a web analytics tool like Google Analytics or all kinds of data in their organization to optimize marketing, take your hand down. Perfect. You're in the right spot. Number two, how many, everybody who doesn't have a fully data-driven organization where every decision is made on data, take your hand down. Is there any? There's two there. We need to talk afterwards. So um, you can just go now because it's not relevant for you guys. So the presentation I'm going to talk about today is some of the learnings I've done as a consultant. We have a lot of data in organizations. We're going to get more and more data every single day. But the question is not about the data. The question is, what do we do with the data? So a quick introduction to, um, to myself. There I am. I work at a Danish digital marketing agency called IIH Nordic. I am a certified web analyst from the Digital Analytics Association. We are around 200 certified web analysts in the world. I also actually have a web analytics education. It is actually possible from the University of British Columbia. And we have a couple of, uh, have a couple of certification in, in different tools. So a little bit about the company I work for. We've been in the field for the last 12 years, which is pretty much from almost the beginning of, of digital. We, um, we service clients primarily in the Scandinavian, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland. And we also serve a wide range of clients internationally. So this is the second slide. It's one of those slides my boss said, Casper, you just have to bring it. So there it is. Some of our certifications, you will find pretty much everything from data visualization to Google Analytics Premium to the even more expensive digital analytics from Comscore. So let's dive into today's topic. So today's topic is about data. So of the people in here, how many actually use Google Analytics on a daily basis? Perfect. How many uses it multiple times a day? The whole day. Anybody? Perfect. Are you a consultant? Oh, perfect. So the thing is, we look about some of the statistics because the digital economy is so rapidly changing. In 2010, we had 1.5 billion people connected to the internet. We had an annual e-commerce revenue of $112 billion. In just three years, these numbers have changed. We're now 2.7 billion people connected to the internet. We send on average 400 million tweets a day. Most of them are probably about cats. What's even more interesting is that the, we've doubled the revenue from e-commerce. So we're now doing 224 billion dollars a year. And these figures are from last year. And approximately, we see roughly, saw roughly 4 billion videos on YouTube. I'm not going to touch, talk so much about YouTube, but how many people are actually leveraging YouTube as a marketing platform, doing advertisements on YouTube? Exactly. There's not many people. So one of the the things that we're seeing is that there's such a huge potential to start leveraging video. Video doesn't need to be 
extremely complicated. It doesn't need to be huge production to gain amazing results. So think about that in your marketing strategies. Think about YouTube. So the thing is, we're surrounded about data every single day. We have our digital analytics data. We used to call it web analytics, and it's really complicated. We started calling it web analytics. Then somebody in the digital analytics organization said, oh, we also have apps. Okay, so we'll change the name. So we changed it to digital analytics. Sounds quite sexy. Then this guy from Forrester Research came up and said, ah, it's not sexy enough. So we have to change it one more time. So we changed it to digital intelligence. So now we call our industry digital intelligence to resemble more business intelligence because that's basically what we do. We connect data from multiple different sources and stitch it all together. So the thing is we have a lot of data every single day. And the thing is tomorrow we'll have even more data. But it's not about the data because all this data, there's just a tendency that marketeers say, we want more and more and more data. When we start doing Google Analytics or all our web analytics vendors, we just want like, can we collect that data? Perfect. I want user IDs. I want every single touch point. I want every single interaction a user makes on my website. I want to track it. And we have this obsession about collecting data. And that's what's been going on in the industry for quite a while. As a consultant, many companies I come out to when I speak with them, they're like, how can we get more data? There's the perception, the more data we have, the better our business is going to get. But the thing is, when I come out and speak to organizations, the first thing I ask is, what do you use the data for? And people go, yeah, we look at page views, it's kind of sexy, um, bounce rates, and we look at time on site, all these vanity metrics that actually doesn't say anything about how my, how my business is performing. So why do we need all that data to just gather those few metrics? So the thing is, it's not about the data. Data is not worth much. It is as soon as we start connecting the data to our business and start taking action upon data. It is the actions we take upon data that will create business value. If we see a problem, perfect. It's still going to be a problem until we do something about it. So there's become a hype. And typically, when we talk about data and we talk about um, the C-suite, the chief executive officer, the chief marketing officer, these people have a really hard time grabbing data. So the first origin of big data actually was back in uh, the mid of the 18th century, where the Oxford Dic Dictionary listed it as information explosion. Later in the mid uh, 2000s, we saw a, a new trend going on where we start calling it big data. The funny thing about big data is that how many in here know exactly what, what big data is? Exactly. So there's, people actually don't know what big data is. It's a little bit fluffy. And, and the thing is, we always have a tendency to say big data is just a lot of data. But the thing is, it, there's so many more aspects to it. So this guy, a professor uh, called Dan Orley, he came up with a wonderful definition of what's happening with the word big data. So as Dan said, Big data is like teenager sex. Everybody talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it, so everyone claims that they're doing it. <laughs> and that's pretty much what's happening. So we'll be going out to meetings. We'll be asking the CMO, so are you using big data? And it's like, yeah, sure. So what are you using for? Ah, yeah. But we, we definitely have it. I'm sure we have it. But the thing is, it's just, been a, it's just a word without meaning in many contexts. So luckily, the MIT Sloan Management Review from Massachusetts uh, uh, Institution of Technology, 
did a research project. They did a research project with IBM where they interviewed 3,000 executives on analytics. What's interesting about this research project is that they asked the, um, the executives, could you please list us the three biggest barriers you have in using analytics? And the three things that they came up with was, number one, lack of understanding of how to use analytics to improve the business, lack of management brand-wide to competing priorities, lack of skills internally in the line of the business. So people don't know how to use the stuff. And it's internally within the organization the problem is. This is not a problem about data. It's not a problem about having the best tools to collect data or analyze data or visualize data. It's about what the hell are we going to do with the data? And also, how do we overcome these internal barriers? So, if we look at the findings from the research, the research found that in the top performing companies, they were twice as likely to be leveraging analytics. Also, the biggest challenge in adopting analytics is managerial and cultural. And finally, one of the findings they found was that visualizing data will become increasingly important. And the reason for that is the way our brains work. Our brains can't absorb a huge spreadsheet of information. But we can evaluate from a graph if it's going up. It's most likely quite good if it's a KPI we want to monitor. And if it's going down, it's most likely quite bad. Also, if it's red, it typically indicates something is wrong. So being able to visualize these vast amounts of information is becoming increasingly important. But the thing is, it takes more than one person. How many of you guys have more than one person in your organization or team working with analytics? A couple of people. So, Typically what I see is that companies, they have this one ninja just rocking data. This guy who's crunching Google Analytics, who's the Kung Fu master of building these sexy custom reports. And the thing he's doing every single day is just firing off one report after another. And that's really good. He thinks he's the rock star of the company because he's delivering actionable insights to senior level management. And the thing is, if we look at the other side of the, pay, uh, the table, the people who actually receive these reports, it looks something like that. People are like, oh. Reports get stuck. Sometimes they just go directly to the spam filter. They never get read, and they never get taken action upon. So the thing is, how can we overcome this main challenge? One of the elements we can, and tools we can use is to visualize the data. So being able to visualize data to make it easier for people to understand and interpret it is crucial for the business. So let's look at the definition of what visual analytics is. Visual analytics is the representation and presentation of data that exploits our visual perception abilities in order to amplify cognition. Yeah, what does that mean? So that means that our brain have a really hard time focusing on more than five data points at the same time. So it relates to the way we're built. 70% of our senses are visual. We need to see things visually. So one of the ways we can visualize data is to leverage one of these 11 different mythologies. We can do a length. Up here, it's quite easy to see 
there's one of the elements that is longer than the other. We can also see in the enclosure down here that we have a, a focus on a particular data point. So let me come with, with an example of this. How many times does the number nine figure up here? Anybody who can quickly answer that question? One? Great. It's wrong. So um, let's start, try to use a little bit of data visualization to enhance this. We can start doing a color hue. So now we can actually see there's a couple of different times the figure nine occurs. We can also do a little bit of enclosure. And now it's extremely easy to see the number nine figures 10 times. Just applying a little bit of data visualization helps enhance the readability of data. The, this is one of the main learnings that we've done working with organizations is when we want to communicate data, we want to visualize it. We want to make it edible. We want the management, we want the marketeers, we want the people who can take action upon data to quickly get an overview and say, here's a problem, let's do something about it. One of the other things that I see companies struggling with is trying to assess how mature they are. What are the different steps in working with analytics? Obviously, the first step is data. So the first step that many companies do, they collect a vast amount of information. Sometimes you need to clean it and convert it, put it into a data warehouse, and you start integrating it into other system, and you start storing it and reporting it. This is pretty much where I see most companies, what most companies are doing. It is the infinite stage of analytics. And typically, this could be driven from a general level within the organization. Typically, the guy in, in, in marketing doing analytics in Google Analytics. So the next stage is to go into a human-centric, analytics-orientated approach, where we start doing explorative analysis. We start analyzing the data, communicating data to the rest of the organization, monitor the data vi by visualizing it and putting it on dashboards in the organizations for everybody to see. And we start doing predictive analytics. We start forecasting what will happen in one month, what will happen in two months. Because if we can start pre doing predictive analytics, we can start also adjusting our marketing initiatives to the changes that might occur. Finally, we have our, there it is, we have the business-centric approach. This is the holy grail of organizations. This is the level where we start to scale, embed, and transform the way the organization is. So we take analytics out from marketing, because typically we have data in multiple places within the organization. We have our digital intelligence data within marketing, Google Analytics, for instance, social media data. And we have our business intelligence, and our business intelligence data typically lies within IT. And IT and marketing go like that. Typically, you don't talk to IT, because IT they will always be like, ah, it's not possible, we can't do it, it's way too complicated, or it's gonna be expensive. So the thing is, when we start getting to the business-centric approach up here, we need, we'll have an organization where IT delivers the, um, and is in charge of the data, and the data quality. Marketing will have the ability to take action upon uh, marketing-centric initiatives. And ultimately, we will also see in the future, and we're starting to see it now, organizations having a chief analytics officer. Obviously, that's not for all organizations. But we are going to be seeing companies that have a senior level person in between IT and marketing 
focusing on asking the right business questions. Because instead of just focusing on how many people actually clicked on a banner or viewed a banner and converted, we would much rather need to focus on what is the lifetime value of that customer? What is the, how many advertisements did we actually show over a longer period of time? How much are we actually paying to have this customer in our databases? And is that actually profitable? And many organizations are just not at that stage yet. So we're still very immature when we're doing analytics. As you mentioned, I guess, we're starting to focus on multi-channel uh, attribution, which is great. Because obviously, optimizing a business based on a last click approach, where we credit the last interaction a visitor had 100%, it's not sustainable because we know that or in a recent study from Google, an average consumer interacts with 10.5 data points or channels before converting. So we need to know all these different data points and credit them. But we also need to calculate how much money are we actually using on these customers. So if you look at a data-driven organization, we the future will include all these different steps. Although we need to start a place. One of the places where we start is we want to ensure that the right people who can act upon data has the data. So if you're in charge of site performance, obviously you should focus on site performance related metrics because these are the things you can act upon. You should also, if you're working as a campaign manager, should be focusing on the general performance of the marketing initiatives, the campaigns that you are performing. You shouldn't be focusing on the load times if you're managing campaigns, because you're just gonna get so much data you can't act upon. It might sound extremely simple, but giving people the right information that they can act on is the first step in starting to leverage analytics within your organization. So the second step when we're starting to do that is to start visualizing data and giving people access to the data and tools and methodologies. We see that some companies are starting to apply data visualization tools like uh, Tableau or ClickView, where a marketeer who's in charge of campaigns will be able to dig directly into the databases where all the data is merged together from the web analytics, digital analytics platforms, and the business intelligence systems. So he can quickly go in, if he has a business question, say, so people who actually engaged with my campaign, how did they actually perform after they became customers? Finally, we want to reach the holy grail. The holy grail is automating the process. Companies that are amazing at doing this in real time, a company like Amazon. How many of you guys have gone to Amazon and got a recommendation and actually bought something based on that recommendation Amazon made? Any of you guys? Perfect. Also, if we look at Netflix, have an extremely sophisticated algorithm. So it will try to predict which person are you what should we show you to keep you engaged and viewing more and more videos on our platform? These informations are delivered to you real time. They are delivered to you when you need it, not two weeks later. For instance, if you're in a purchase decision and you want to buy a TV, the marketing team doing an analytics might figure that out a couple of days later. But at that point, you're not in the decision process anymore. So we want to make sure that we engage you with the right advertisements at the right time to the right person. One of the elements of overcoming this analytics barrier within an organization is to firstly identify the, where the weak points are. So one of the methodologies we can use to this is called the online analytics maturity model. So originally, the model was called the web analytics maturity model. Again, the industry changed name, 
So Stefan also had to change the name of his model. Stefan is the director of innovation at Cardinal Path, one of the largest digital marketing agencies in the United States. Stefan wrote his maturity model in 2009. And what's interestingly enough is that it's still today extremely relevant for organizations. So the maturity model Stefan built, and this is uh, available in the public domain, so you can go download it if you want to. It measures the organization's maturity on digital analytics on three, sorry, on six different levels or areas. So we have the management, we'll have the objective, the scope, expertise, process, and tools. What we're doing in our company is that when we're engaging a new client, we want to see how mature is this client? And what's interesting enough is that clients have different opinions on how mature they are. So we're looking at the actual model itself. It's based upon three crucial elements that all needs to be there in order to le fully leverage digital analytics. It's the business, the technology, and the analysis. So first we need to figure out what is our strategy? What is our goals of actually being digital? What are we trying to achieve? And are these actionable? We need to obviously have our technology in place to collect data we, and our tools. We need our analysis levels. And most crucially, we need our recommendation and actions, which are fed back in the system, and we loop it again and again. So the actual model itself looks like this you'll have low maturity rated as one, high maturity within a area rated as five. So what we did, I'm gonna show you some client data here from a, a client. So we applied this model, it's a, a model of five different questions, six, di sorry, six different questions in each area, and we looked at some of the answers. So for this particular client, the chief marketing officer this was his ideal of how the company looked. Overall, you would say it's quite impressive. An extremely mature company, full governancing data, has a firm understanding of its process and methodologies, a little bit low on the team, but obviously all CMOs, they think that their team should be bigger and need more budget. So interestingly, we, we also asked the marketing manager. And the marketing manager didn't believe that the processes and methodology was in order. But what's even more interesting is that when we ask the digital analyst, the picture is totally different. He says, yes, we have the technologies, we have the tools, we have the process and methodologies and crunching the data, but the thing is, we don't have it aligned with our business objectives. We haven't aligned it with the governance in the organization. It's not being fully leveraged. By being able to use a model like this, you can start assess where your organization is and where the discrepancies are between different people. When you know this, you can start working on it and start acting on it. Here's the link to the maturity model, which is free if you want to take it. So I want to give an example of companies that take data and make it action oriented. This is one of my favorite cases from Kleenex. So what Kleenex did is, obviously they sell paper. And one of the seasons for them is when people get a cold or a flu. But how do you know when to put the Kleenex boxes in the supermarket? Because it, it, it's expensive distributing all this stuff. So, Kleenex took another approach to collecting data and making it actionable. So there's a small video here. Is everything. So Kleenex found out to their cost when they launched their cold and flu campaign in the hottest October ever. The results were sickening. The following year, we found a remedy, adaptive planning. That means, like everyone else, 
we did a bit of self-diagnosis before going to the doctor. We googled. Or to be specific, we started an AdWords auction with the deliberate intention of losing. Bidding on keywords to get local data on people looking for... remedies. This meant we could adapt the Kleenex budget and only spend where people were actually falling ill. Ensuring that at the first sign of a sneeze or sniffle, Kleenex was at hand and in hand. It paid off. With over 96% of media spend going to regions suffering a live flu outbreak, Kleenex saw total sales rise by 40% year on year in the first two months of the campaign. That's 432,499 extra boxes sold. Now that is a figure not to be sneezed at. So now, whatever the health of the nation, thanks to a revolutionary new way of using research data, Kleenex is fighting fit. So this is a great example of how a company took a problem, added data, and made that data actionable. So this is the actual dash dashboard that Kleenex used which their CPC managers were able to, uh, to look at in real time and start adjusting their media spend. So what can we learn from this? So we can learn from it that applying data to support a adaptive planning process beats the best guesstimates. So we want to remove the gut feeling within organizations. We also learned that if you can't find the information you need, think outside the box. For Kleenex, it was to start deliberately losing, uh, creating an AdWords campaign that they knew that they were loose, just to collect the data and suck it out from the AdWords API. They also found out that they were able to visualize the data so the people who are actually doing the media planning were able to take action upon it. And finally, they were able to document it as an internal success story on how to use data. So all the campaigns that they would be doing in the future would use the same methodologies. It later won the uh, Cannes Lion Award for Best Creative. Another case which I really love is the Target case. Like that. So Target, an American-based supermarket, um, wanted to do something different. In marketing, one of the segments that is highly um, valuable are pregnant women. Pregnant women use, are 15 times more valuable for a marketer than a regular person is because they have a different buying pattern. So what Target did is that they hired a statistician named Andrew Pohl, as, um, who joined the company. Shortly after Andrew joined the company, two guys from marketing comes down to him and ask him a question. What if we figure out if a customer is pregnant, even if you don't want us to know, can you do that? A little bit of a creepy question. So Andrew started crunching up all this data. And the good thing about Target is that everybody buys from a loyalty card. So we have their demographics. We know exactly what they purchased. So he could start sewing up the, uh, stitching up this data together. So what he found was actually that pregnant people tend to buy 25 different products that resemble unscented lotions, vitamin, vitamin supplies, hand sanitizers, and washcloths. So by identifying these 25 products, he was able to build a model that could identify and score if a person or woman was pregnant or not. So they were assigned this particular value to all their customers, or female customers at least, and then they start acting upon it. They started sending out newsletter, newsletters with offers like, shouldn't you be wanting to buy some baby uh, clothes? Wouldn't you buy some baby-related uh, products? The result of this was that Within the category, they saw an explosion in sales because obviously it was targeted to the right people. There was also a catch with this because it turns out, and that was the story from before, 
that in the US, a, one day a dad comes down to the local Target store and says, guys, why are you sending my 16-year-old daughter emails about children's stuff, like baby stuff? It's so unapproved. Obviously, the store manager said, I'm sorry. Um, it's a mistake. Two weeks later, he comes down to the same store and says, I apologize. Um, there was something my daughter hadn't told me. So there are also ethical dilemmas involving in this. And what Target learned from that experience is that they start mixing in other products like a lawn motor and a TV. And so it, it looks like a random email, but obviously it's highly targeted. Another example is the hippo approach. How many of you guys know what a hippo is? And not the animal. Perfect. So Avinash Kaushik was one of the first people, he's the chief marketing evangelist for Google, to coin phrase the word hippo. So the hippo is the high paid person's opinion. The guy with the highest salary in the room is going to judge, say whatever he wants is going to be the end result. If he wants a dancing monkey on the website, there's going to be a dancing monkey on the website. That's how the hippos work. So let's try to look at a scenario where the hippo would overrule. So the first example here with business challenge, should we get a mobile website? The hippo looks at the budgets and says, nobody's using mobile. I'm not using mine. So obviously we shouldn't invest in mobile. It's going to be expensive. We have to do our website responsive and it's going to take 100 years. So we're not going to do it. So the hippo says, no. The second scenario, we start using data. So we don't base our, f our decisions on gut feeling and hippos. We base it on information. So in the case here where we have data, we can just dig into our Google Analytics data and say, do you know what? We can actually see that last month, 11.42% of all our visitors came from a mobile device. When we start communicating that 173,000 people came from a mobile device, this is the face of the hippo. What is 173,000 people? So we need to put numbers into context. And one of the recent examples we could do that is saying it's the same as the capacity of Michigan Stadium. Every single month, these people serve our website from a mobile device. So some of the takeaways I want to give you today is the first recommendation. When we're looking at analytics and adopting analytics within the organization, first think biggest. Focus on the highest value and business opportunities that you can take action upon. Obviously, these are going to create most value for you and your business, and they're also going to be a great example that you can move forward with. Secondly, we want to start in the middle. So we don't want to start with data because we'll just get too, dig in, too dug into the data. We want to look at the business question. What is the question we want to ask? And what is the question we want to solve? S always start with the question. Recommendation number three, make analytics come alive. Start embedding these insights and actions into your organizations. Start making it an integrated part of the process when taking decisions. Whether or not that's being a test on the website, should we change a picture? Let's use data. Let's figure out, let's run an A-B test. Is our hypothesis and the second version, is that actually better than our original content? Recommendation number four, add, don't detract. So what you already have, keep it and start building upon that. Recommendation number five, build the parts, not the whole. So we are going to be seeing a strong growth in analytics. As mentioned earlier, we have data in multiple places within the organization. We have it in marketing, we have it in IT. Start 
by one area and build upon that. So if your organization currently only can leverage the marketing analytics data, start by looking at that. You can always build upon it later. Don't try to build the big holy grail of model. And finally, think about this quote. Information is powerful, but it's how we use it that will define us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, are there any questions in the audience? Uh, there's also an option to use uh, social media like Twitter you, by using hashtag iLive2014. So we will read some of the questions from that. Uh, so we already have like a like few questions So uh, from, from online. So I have this about like analytics specialists. So you mentioned that there are certified like 200 in one of the organizations. And I also read that like uh, in few years in the United States alone there will be a shortage of uh, analytics persons like they will need like 150,000 or something like that. So what are your insights onto like specialists or they will become well like more and more needed? So th there is definitely a, um, a growing interest for analytics in organizations. It originally started by saying, can we have some information? And it started evolving to an integrated part of the process. I think the challenge for organizations right now is that the guy doing analytics is also doing 10 other things in the organization. He's also doing a little bit of uh, CPC optimization, a little bit of split testing. So we're going to be seeing a lot more dedicated analytics resources within the organization. When we have those resources, we're also going to be seeing an analytics manager and an evolution of a small analytics team. And from there, we'll scale it up. So there's going to be a, a growth within organizations because obviously data is going to be one of the competing and most important elements of being competitive in the future and keeping a competitive edge. Yeah, well, and I guess uh, that salary also will be pretty big, how to say, analytics will <laughs> earn a lot of money, you know, because they are in, in need, right? They, uh, they have quite good salaries. <laughs> okay. so, but, I will actually say one thing. When I started out in the industry, analytics was like, it was one guy doing the tech implementations, the guy delivering business recommendations, and the guy doing the, all the analysis. Over the last year or so, we're seeing that these three roles are starting to split out. So we'll have developers focusing solely on data collection and making sure that we collect the right information and these are typically developers. Secondly, we see that people with backgrounds in statistics start building extremely complicated models and is in charge of that piece of the process. And finally, the guys who actually stitch it all together and communicate it into the rest of the organization. So that's now three people. We're good. Okay. Thank Let's you. give a round of applause to Casper. Yeah.